the first round went straight through my neck and the second round ricocheted off the off my helmet. And probably would have taken my arm completely off. In the Falklands, they probably realised they could have done with a lot better kit. I wake up in Birmingham, I see you. Toby, how are you, brother? I'm good, thanks, Chris. And we should thank Ben, shouldn't we, for putting us in touch that's right. Yeah, he's a good lad, Ben. Yeah, very, very brave young man. He came on the podcast to talk about his. Um, I don't even. I don't like to use the word Walter me, but that's what people will know <laughs> know what I'm talking about. And um, now he's actually serving himself. So big up you, Ben, and thank you for putting me and Toby in touch. So my God, so much to talk about, mate, and all yeah, all the stuff I like, like South Africa, for example. I spent time in Johannesburg and. Went to the where I'm from. That's where I was born. Yeah, born and raised. Born and raised. Yeah, it's mental there, eh? It is. A, it is a crazy place, and yeah, to to grow up there, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some of some people like to say it's it's like the wild west. Yeah, because my childhood, we lived through all the apartheid thing. We saw the Zulus with their spears on TV. People laugh when I say this. They think I'm joking. I'm like, no, it it you know what people don't realize in africa is when they colonize the place they just drew these lines on a map didn't they and that split tri literally split tribes down <laughs> down the middle yeah. and um and uh of course a lot of the uh, zulu tribe from what i understand ended up in soweto so like the the ghetto housing and we would see the riots with the South African police on the telly every night. And when I was lucky enough to visit there in about 1999, I think it was, um, they were just coming through apartheid then. And I was with a South African girl and we were out one night standing on a street corner and Wild West was just an understatement. And I said, do you feel safe here? You know, she's this like nine stone little white girl and there's these big, huge, tough fellas everywhere. And um, she said, well, when, um, when they got black rule, she said a lot of the, the whites just left, even though they were native Africans because they'd been born there, they were terrified. She said, but some of us stayed and, um, yeah, I'll, just, I'll never forget her saying that. But yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I was I was born in I was born in nineteen eighty five. So you know, apartheid only ended ended when in nineteen ninety five or, or late nineteen ninety four four. If you want to get really really technical, um, um, so the first ten years of my life were brought up through the apartheid you know, era. And then after that, we had the, you know, from, so from after apartheid, I grew up, you know, in my teens and whatever else. Um, so I had that mixture of both experiences. Um, but yeah, I was quite, I was quite young through the, through the actual apartheid era, but I still remember, you know, black kids not being allowed to, go to school and the riots and, um, you know, the difficult challenges. And, and I mean, I never really understood it because I was quite young, but it was always there, you know, and, and I guess that's the kind of culture that they wanted to instill, you know, um, that you thought it was normal that, you know, Indigenous people or Black people should be treated this way. Um, which is terrible, which is absolutely horrendous. Um, and again, my parents are English, so I'm from the English heritage, um, and my parents didn't agree with it at all. So, you know, I was always taught that that was not 
acceptable at all. Um, mm-hmm. Even though we lived there, we were we were always taught, you know, this is not acceptable in any way, shape, or form. Yes, of course. And what what brought you to the UK then, Toby? Was it was it a family move, or was it specifically to join a corps? Um, no, I mean, I, I've always been a bit of a, uh, well, my family, I've always been a bit of a nomad, kind of no land, no, no place really family. We, um, so my parents immigrated to South Africa in like the sixties or seventies. And then, um, after about, well, off. After apartheid ended in 1995, you know, we, we immigrated to America when I was, God, I must have been about 12, something like that, or 11. No, I was 11. I was about 11 years old. We immigrated to America um, and, and lived in California for a while. Um, so that was pretty wicked. But as, as a, I guess at that age, it, it was tough. It was tough because... You know, new country, new culture, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and then that didn't really work out. So then we moved to the UK. Uh, My parents immigrated from America to the UK, and we tried to live here for a while, um, and that didn't really work out. So then my parents decided, well, it was actually just my mom because she was a single mom. Um, yeah, we ended up moving back to back to South Africa, believe it or not. Um, and that's where I, yeah, spent my sort of teenage years growing up to where I was about 19, somewhere around there, yeah. And, that, and then um, that's when I decided uh, I've had enough. I want to I wanna join the Corps. But... Um, the reason I wanted to join the Corps or the Marines, the Royal Marines, was I just needed to get out of South Africa again. You know, I was going down a bad path. I was doing some really bad stuff. I was um, in a lot of trouble. Uh, and I was just fortunate enough to have the sort of, I guess, the mindset to know that if I stay here, I'm even going to end up dead or in prison um and i didn't see any future for me there so yeah um that's why i left south africa and um decided to come over and join the core mm. as it were yeah you got into the party scene in south africa i'm assuming um yeah i mean again uh, the party scene yeah I, I, <sighs> south africa was a crazy place you know um, underage drinking and drink driving and drugs and stuff like that is so easy to do because the country's in such turmoil, you can get away with so much and it's really easy to go down a bad path, like super easy. And um, you only have to be a bit of a wild child and want to try these things. And before you know it, uh, yeah, you, you're up to your neck and in trouble um so yeah i was i was trying i guess yeah trying some stuff and figuring out who i was and um it wasn't going well it wasn't going well put it that way um i wasn't going to school um and if i was i was so hungover i don't even i don't even remember what was going on um so yeah yeah it wasn't good it wasn't good <clears throat> Did you come to UK on your own that, the second time then? Yeah, yeah, I came over. Um, I, got to, I was working in a bar in South Africa when I was about 19, 20, 20 years old. And um, I decided to just start saving some cash. Um, so I had enough for a flight, a flight, airplane tickets. Um, and I just packed a, you know, rucksack and, and came over to the UK. I didn't really have a plan. Um, I guess I kind of knew I wanted to join the Corps, but I didn't even know how to join the Corps. I didn't know how to join the Marines. Um, I just came over to the UK, uh, landed at Heathrow, and was like, 
right, what next? You know, um, where do I go from here? Uh, so my parents were from Bristol, so I figured I'd go out there. That's the only place I really knew, kind of. Um, yeah, it was the only place I really knew. So, so I got a, tr- uh, kind of a train or a bus or something um, and got this uh, one-bedroom flat. No, it was a one-bedroom, like, bed set, and I was staying in there. Um, and, yeah, that's how it started and then started just formulating a plan and, you know, getting the mindset and getting ready, you know, okay, this is really happening now. This is really what I want to do. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it started. What do you do then as a uh, – so, uh, did you have an English passport? Yeah, because my parents were English, uh, so they, they were smart enough to, um, to get me a British passport when I was very, very young. So I had dual, dual nationality, so I was all right. Um, yeah, but uh, I know a lot of South Africans don't, and, yeah, now they're stuck in South Africa and got nowhere else to go. Mm. So was that uh, – the reason I ask is obviously – if you're a British national, it must make it easier join it, joining the military. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, obviously, I did because I, I think they asked for uh, they wanted like you know a bit of a background on you when you join the corps. They want to know your background, and I didn't have like five years living in the country and stuff and stuff like that. But having the British passport helped. I just needed to um, get a bit more information from South Africa and proof of address and stuff like that and um, a few other bits. I can't really remember now. It was so long ago. But, uh, yeah, I remember having to jump through a few hoops. Um, mm. But it certainly did help, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, um, which was good. Did you have a thing in the recruiting office where they said jump up on a pull-up bar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you, I mean, I just went down to the recruitment office and was like, Cool. Uh, yeah, um, spoke to a guy at the front desk and was like, I, I want to join the Royal Marines. And now he's looking at you like, um, okay, like a bit suspect, I guess. And um, yeah, he was like, okay, I went upstairs and then some sergeant major, I guess, came down and called me upstairs. And, and that's where, yeah, he was like, all right, can you do your, I don't know what it was, was it? Six pull-ups or ten pull-ups. I can't even remember now. And twenty press-ups on the floor, and and that. And then asked me a few questions as to why I wanted to join the corps, and, and that was it. Really. Yeah. And then he was like, "All right, give me the details, and we'll get back to you." What year did you actually join it? Join in, Toby? Uh, I joined in two thousand six. But I think I I think I went through training in probably. Yeah, 2000, beginning, yeah, 2006, beginning of 2006. Yeah, they say that's when training got really, really easy, don't they? <laughs> all right, mate, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, there was that. Um, yeah, we, we, we got a few. Uh, I, think, I think we just started getting those blue um, duvets instead of, instead of the blankets. You know, those you very know old, lucky you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but saying that, I mean, I I saw recruits going through training not too long ago. And and now, Christ, uh, they've got, um, you know, lower alpine, lower marine boots and um, uh, jet boilies and all kinds of stuff, you know. Um, so... Yeah, now it's even softer. Um, well, no, no, I, can't, I don't want to say that. No, you know, marine training is tough. It is hard. I think we were one, just about when I joined, we was the time that they swapped from, did we call them, you, you probably wouldn't know, but I think they were called Pusser's Daps. And they were, they were white plimsolls. Like, I mean, they're all trendy and in fashion now, but back then they were the sort of plimsolls you, you wore you you wore to primary school to do your PE in. <laughs> oh, you mean, did you have the, because I, I had the black, sh- uh, the silver shadows, you know, the... Um, we we went on to I, that. I, for, for all our gym work, we had to wear these white 
plimp cells. All right. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, now I know they've got like ASICs. Yeah. Whatever they're called. They've got like proper trainers now. I mean, we just had those, yeah, the Silver Shadow high tech crappy little trainers. <laughs> Well, you went downhill then because we were, I think, one of the first troops to get issued Reeboks, pro- proper running trainers. What? Yeah. Reeboks Royale, I think they were called. And they they actually were pretty cool. But the problem... No, the- we didn't get us, no. The no, prob- we didn't did not get us. Yeah, the problem was some of the lads got brand new ones and they looked smart as hell. <laughs> and the others, we got second out ones from someone who'd, who... <laughs> Obviously, Jack jacked it in, but but yeah, and that was about the time when they started to realise that the old school way of doing stuff was just causing lots of injuries. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, and that was because we still had the old, you know, the old military boots, the black, mm. the black leather thing that was so, you know what I mean? Was, yeah, they call them. Is it DPS or something? That the the, the moulded D- DMS. Something yeah, molded, you know, molded soul, yeah, and uh, yeah, the molded solid soul, and um, took you about three years to wear them in, <laughs> and um, you had blisters, you know, and shin splints, and all the. They were probably been around since I don't know the bloody World War Two or something. You know, mm. um, they were just literally a piece of leather with a rubber sole. Um, but now, yeah, you're right. They started looking into these things and yeah, it was causing more injuries and they were losing so many lads because of injuries. I think they started changing things, which is probably for the best, if I'm honest. Um, you know, if a kid if a kid gets better, it's not always the mindset of oh no, we'll stick to doing what we know because that's just what we know. Um, and it makes makes recruits tougher and we only get the best of the best. That's not always the case, if you know what I mean. No, exactly. I think it, it, in the Falklands, they probably realised they could have done with a lot better kit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, well, you, you talk about the Falklands, but it was the same in, in the Gulf. You know, they needed a lot better kits. And it was the same in Afghanistan, you know. Um, yeah, and the training as well, you know. Um, training facilities... It was, it was crazy because I remember we were training for Af- Afghan, right, which is the desert and all that kind of old desert warfare, but all the training was geared up for Northern Ireland. So it was all kind of rural stuff and, and walking through streets and patrolling through streets and stuff like that. Um, and that just held no usefulness mm. in Afghanistan, if I'm honest. Yes, yeah, so I bet they learnt an awful lot in theatre in Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. Um, Best yeah, even the rifles, you know, the rifle, the SA-80 is not, <laughs> is not, like, is not good in sand and dust. Lots and lots of dust. It clogs up. It clogs up massively. Um, yeah, so, you know, things like that. They had to, yeah, think about, I guess. But you only learn that and you only evolve as you go along. Didn't they realise that the SE-80 didn't have the stopping power either when you've got some mad Afghan, Afghan off his head on something coming towards you? It just wasn't stopping them enough. Yeah, I think, I think that's because of the high velocity round. Um, it'll go straight through you so quick. Um, and unless obviously you hit them, you know, obviously in the in that centre of mass or uh, or or in the head, it, mm. it just doesn't stop them because it goes right through so quick. Um, uh, and I mean, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, that was one of the things. But I think it was more because you know the SAT works on gas parts, gas gas parts, gas moving parts. That just clogs up with the dust and the sand. Um, mm-hmm. So things like that, that's how you start thinking on their feet a little bit quicker. What's uh, what? Have you got any particular memories of training? Was there stuff you were bad uh, at and stuff that you were yeah. good at? Yeah, I mean, uh, I love training. 
Um, I, yeah, I absolutely love training. It's probably one of the best times of my life. I know that sounds kind of a bit sadistic because it is horrible. It is horrible and it's tough, but the friends, the friends I made in training, I'm still very good friends with now. Mm. Um, and then um, there's some of my best mates, you know, um, so things like that. And we had such a laugh together, you know. I know, I know it's, it's always tough and that, but, but when you're with a group of mates and you're going through tough times and adversity, it really, really bonds you together. Um, and when you're out on those little um, exercises for weeks or whatever, I can't remember, you know, what they call Hunter's Moon and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just, it just brought us together and um, it was great. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I have so many stories I could tell you um, because, uh, you know, I, I was a little bit of a naughty little, naughty little uh, sort of troublemaker. You know, you get like your, um, you get two weeks leave at Christmas. Uh, so I was with camp orphan. I had nowhere to go. So, and I, I'd make very good mates with a mate called John Knowles. And he was from Halifax up north. And um, he was also a proper little, um, little shit stirrer as well. And uh, so we went back to Halifax and um, the train team were like, yeah, right, lads, you know, m- make sure you stay on top of your fizz. Make sure you stay on top of your fizz and uh, go and do some homework on core history and, you know, all these sort of things and da 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 and come back relaxed, fresh, ready to go. And uh, me and John were like, I mean, we, we were like sh- straight away, we were like, no, nope, uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to Tenerife for two weeks and we are going to, you know, absolutely. Um, smash it. Smash it out. So, yeah, so we, uh, in the middle of recruit training, uh, yeah, we, we went to Tenerife for two weeks. And absolutely got absolutely just on it for two weeks, pissing it up, um, causing a lot of trouble, uh, staying up all night, you know, doing all the all the party scene, uh, da 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 da, girls, women, you know, um, you know, stealing all their knickers and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and causing trouble. Anyway, we uh, we got back to Limston. Uh, early January or whenever it was. And um, we went from probably two of the fittest recruits in the troop to um, uh, to just basically hanging out uh, on bottom field, absolutely hanging out of our hoops. Uh, and we had the PTIs coming up to us going, what, what's going on there, Tobes? You know, or recruit recruit gut rich as it was. Um, was everything all right? And I, I had to explain to them, you know, that we, we'd, uh, we'd been on a bender for two weeks. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was just going to take me a bit of time to get up to speed again. Um, but, yeah, great, great memories of training. Um, great memories of training. But uh, overall, yeah, we, we were, yeah, I was a very fit young lad. Um and I did very well in training. I um, I uh, managed to um, get the sort of that fittest recruit in in the troop, and I passed out as a as a original original, and all these you know good things. And um, yeah, yeah. So I was I was yeah I was pretty strong pretty strong recruit. Uh, so you had something that uh, the same as me though, Toby because I was homeless when I joined up. So I, it's like that bit in Officer and a Gentleman where he says, I've got nowhere else to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bet, you know, I, I, I didn't have an option. So I, it never crossed my mind to leave ever. It wasn't like a, I didn't, I, I didn't even have, I didn't have a girlfriend either. So it wasn't like I was going to get a dear John and get, you know, my mind, <laughs> get on the rocks or something. Um. So, so yeah, my, my, 
my thing was just right what's on that timetable for the next week let what well That's it. yeah yeah in fact if i was honest it was always right what have we got to do today right we've got to do that let's just go and pass it <laughs> that that was it yeah um no i can totally relate to that because i i didn't have anywhere to go if i if i got kicked out or failed or um injured myself or whatever i had nowhere else to go um and that, that thought was always on the back of my mind of, shit, I don't want to go back to South Africa um, and I've got nowhere else to go. So um, it wasn't really a choice for me. Um, I was going to smash this whether I, whether I liked it or not um, or whether I knew what I was getting myself into or not. Um, but fortunate enough, yeah, I was, I, I was actually quite good at it. So... Yeah. yeah. What, was, what was your endurance course experience like? Um, yeah, it was tough. I, I that was one of my weaker sort of um, commander phases, if I'm if I'm honest. And I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, I think I used to see a lot of anxiety before before it, and um, I think I used to psych myself out like massively psyched myself out before it. Um, and I don't know why, because all the other sort of things, I was I was really good at bottom field and Tarzan, assault course. You know, I, I was top three all, every time. But when it came to the endurance course, I'd sort of, um, yeah, fall back quite a lot. Um, and I, I just, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why. Yeah, it was probably my worst, worst one. It, it was, um, yeah, it was a lick. Of course it was, but um, there was something about it that used to really psych me out uh, before it. Just the whole thing uh, psyched me out massively. Didn't enjoy it at all, if I'm honest. I think it's changed a bit now. I, I'm not say, I'm not trying to say it's got ease or anything, but when you look at all the tunnels set up, it, it all looks really smart and they've got, like these iron grids that they locked, I guess, to stop tourists, you know, going up there or chucking stuff up there. Right. But, but when we did it, you hit those tunnels and they were just collapsing corrugated iron. Yeah, yeah. And some bits of it, you literally under, you could just get your mouth above the water. And they used to say, try and keep your weapon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that was, uh, I think, for, for the, the training team, just to bollock you or just to get you absolutely in trouble for, you know, if you're doing well, that's fun. That's pick you up on something, you know. And that was always something, you know. Oh, look at the state of your rifle. Yeah, you know, and you were like, mate, I've just been, you know, crawling through the mud. Uh, there's absolutely no way. I uh, get to the end of this and pass, or you know, finish in the time frame and keep my rifle clean. It's, it's physically impossible. Yeah, that was my biggest fear: is that I'm going to pass because I never passed it. In I think we did two trial runs, and I was way. I mean, I was like twenty minutes. I walked back on one of it. I was like twenty minutes late or something. Troop officer. It's funny. We're still friends to this day, but he wasn't happy with me. And then when we actually did it, um, my fear was passing it in the time and then failing the shoot at the end. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, no, fortunately, fortunately, I managed. It's a nice, it was a nice thing to pass out as an original. Um, you know, that was, there's that feeling in your mind, isn't it? The whole way, they, they make you feel every day that you're going to get back trooped. Yes, yeah, they really, they really make it as like it's. Um, there's a stigma attached to being back trooped or being a back trooper or having spent time in hunter company and mm. or hunter troop or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, they do put a stigma around it. And um, but uh, wait, to, be honest, to be honest, I made I made such good mates with the, my um, with my troop. I, I just. I didn't want to leave those blokes. I didn't want to have to go into a new troop and have to make uh, new new mates. I think that's that's something that really pushed me on, you know. Um, and I think they felt the same way, to be fair. Yeah, I, I 
I've had a few chats with lads in Hunter Troop and I just said, look, give us a call. And a lot of it, their mind's in the wrong place because of, yeah. it's a horrible experience to go through. Yeah. And, and I just get them a bit fired up and focused. And right. You can get out there. You're going to fucking smash it. And next thing you know, they're sending me a photo of them in their green lid. Yeah. And that's great because, you know, it isn't, it isn't, it's not like a sign of weakness. It, no, not at all. It's the other way around. To come through that, the mental yeah. strength is is it's good good credit good good credit. Absolutely, to it shows it shows grit and determination. You know, mm. injury is something you can't. You, you know, it's not it's injury. It's an injury. Um, but then to stick it out and 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 carry on, yeah, that shows true true character there. Um, so absolutely, if, if anyone's, if any recruits are listening to this or anyone who's, um, I don't know, thinks about joining and finds himself in Hunter, true. Yeah, stick it out. I have a mate actually uh, who, who I started training with. He was another South African chap. And um, he ended up in Hunter, Hunter Troop for so long. I mean, he broke his ankle really badly. And then he had some other problems because he was compensating and so on and so forth. I mean, he was in there for, I think, he was in Hunter Troop for, uh, I swear, it was almost a year before he could go back into, you know, mm. training. And, yeah, they used to call him the nod, the nod father and all that kind of stuff, you know, because he'd been there for so long. Um, but, yeah, you know. There you go. Uh, just shows. And he passed out and he finished training. So, yeah. Um, there you what, go. You, what unit did you go to, mate? Um, so I went to 40. Well, when I finished uh, commander training, I went to 40, 40 commando because um, that was the next the next uh, commando unit going out to Afghan that was being deployed. Uh, and I didn't really join up. Other than to, well, I want I want to, you know, see combat. I want to see. I joined up because I want. That's why I joined up. Yeah, um, yeah. That's all I can say. Really, I didn't really join up because I wanted to get a trade and all that. Um, mm. A lot of it was because I wanted to get out there and get stuck in. I guess. Call that quite, that's a pretty stupid thing to say because it's, it's quite naive. And when I look back, I think, geez, yeah, quite naive. Um, but I was, I was 21, probably now 21 years old and, you know, full of, full of testosterone and full of all that male bravado and oh, I'm a Royal Marine now, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we've all got very different perspectives on war now. Well, I'd like to hope so. They say if you've still got the same views, I think it was Muhammad Ali said, if if you've still got the same views when you're 40 as you had when you're 18 and you've wasted your life. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. With that yeah, 100%, you know, um, I was a young, naive, boisterous kid who just didn't know... If, didn't know what he was getting himself into, if I'm honest. Um, but that's life, you know, that is life. Um, you can only learn by your experiences. And um, yeah, yeah, what can I say? Um, like yourself, much like yourself, Chris, you know, you've learned, you must have learned a lot along the way. Yeah, I was the same as you when, when they said, What unit do you want to go to? I said 4 2 because I knew they would go into the Northern Ireland conflict. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It wasn't that I wanted to. Um, well, I don't. Oh, I probably lie if I said I didn't want to go to war, but it it was more that if I'm going to be in the Marines, I wanted at least to have experienced some form exactly, of combat. Yeah, yeah. Precisely, mm. and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, join the core because I don't know, yeah. I wanted to go and see conflict. I wanted to know what it was like. You um, wanted to have a scrap. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't know. I wanna, and I, yeah, I wanted to grow as a person, but 
I guess it's a, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to, hard to think why, why would you want to go to war? Um, what a stupid thing. Um, but yeah, I guess that's how young boys are, mm. you know? What was that tour like? Um, Herrick Seven was pretty. Yeah, it was. It was horrible. Um, it, it, yeah, it was a tough tour. Uh, we uh, we ended up at the Fobs. Um, I was Alpha Company in Forty Commander, and um, Alpha Company. We were based at Fob Inkerman which was probably like, yeah, it was probably about 10K, 10 kilometers from Sangin up the this, up this Sangin Valley. Um, and it was, uh, May, it was just a, it was just a compound in the middle of nowhere um, on, on some higher ground looking over the Sangin Valley. Um, and when we, when we got there, we took over from, oh, I can't remember. It was an army regiment who were out there, um, but there was there was literally nothing. There was nothing. There was just four mud walls, massive four mud walls, um, and and we yeah came in and we had to we had to make it work. <laughs> if I'm honest, uh, it was grueling. Yeah, we were on, you know 24 hour rations. Um, it was blistering hot. There was no shade. Uh, there's no top cover. Um, we uh, had to dig the trenches for for us to you know piss and shit in. Um, and we had to burn. We had like drums that we put in, and we had to burn that every day um, in the burns pits and stuff like that with diesel. Uh, no showers or anything like that. No no water. Uh, we had to wait for shipments to be dropped in or bottled water. Um, everyone was going down with the shits. Everyone had DMV. Um, we must have lost a third of our company in the first two months to, yeah, to DMV. Um, and we were going out on patrol every day, every day going out on patrol and for eight hours at a time with, Full on kit uh, in the blistering heat. Uh, so yeah, you can imagine what it was like. Um, pretty pretty crap. And then we get shelled most low, well, not most days, but yeah, a lot of the time. You know, there'd be a Chinese rockets or uh, a mortar would come over or uh, an RPG or something. Um, Having to do Sanger rotation, you know, sentry duty um, all night, all day, all night, uh, unless you're on patrol. And yeah, it was, just, it was grueling, man. I'm not gonna, I'm not even gonna deny it. It was tough. Um, it was tough. Uh, did you did you lose people? Yeah, we did. Um, my my section commander unfortunately was killed. Um, so yeah, my section commander unfortunately lost his life, uh, which was devastating because I was I I was really good friends with him, um, and he was he was a really really nice guy. Um, he wasn't one of these section commanders who was. Um, Uh, unapproachable and quite tough. He, he, he was a big, big lad. Um, uh, his name was De- Damien Mulvihill. Mm. Um, and we used to call him Big D. Um, he was a really nice lad. Um, he, he was a very popular figure. Yeah, he was. And, and um, But he was really approachable and calm and we like a big giant, you know, mm. uh, you know, a big soft giant of a, of a guy. Uh, and 
But, I mean, he was so easy to talk to and some nights on century duty at three in the morning, I'd be on century with, with Big D and we'd be talking and um, we'd be chatting about life and he'd be telling about his missus and how he just got engaged and um, I'd be talking about, uh, I don't know, South Africa and um, he, he was a big water polo, water polo player. He used to play for the core, actually. He used to play water polo for the core. And South African water polo is a big sport. So I used to talk to him about that. And rugby, he was a big rugby fan. And, um, you know, we, we'd be talking, we, uh, we just had so much in common, you know, and um, we just, yeah, we were good, good mates, really good mates. And um, it was, yeah, one of the worst times, worst things I could ever think of. Um, and that that's when I, you know, that's when you really start I guess you should, you really start knowing what war is all about and and what real loss is really about and um, how horrible it is because he didn't he didn't pass away in a very nice way. Um, we it was an IED um, and it still it still really shakes me up to this day and um, yeah, God rest his soul. Um, it gets. Do you get that feeling? It's coming back to me now. It it gets really real in that moment, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, even now, it still brings it all back. I can feel it. Um, really brings it all back. Um, yeah, and it's, it's how many years later? It's still, uh, it's, uh, it's horrible. It really makes you realise the reality of life. And, and It makes you... Yeah. It brings it home as well, how massively how brave you are to be a royal marine did, did you think that yeah yeah just you know any soldier out there you just uh, crack on the neck you just got to crack on the next day as you know put it behind you and it's i mean it's just ugh, beyond words really it is it is and it's a, um i give my utmost respect to anyone who's signed up and wants to serve um, and, and, and has been out there and, and done it. Um, yeah. Top, top respect because it's horrible and it's, um, it's something that you, you know, you can only talk to people who have been there and done it and done things. Yeah. It's hard to, it's really hard to talk to people who don't, who haven't been there and experienced it. Um, it's really hard to get that. Uh, just to relate, it's really difficult. So, I mean, uh, ordinarily at this point, I'd say I'd come come in with a PTSD sort of angle, but, but of course that normally hits you after you leave the core, but before you left, you had your own shit to deal with. So yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, come on, we'll come on to that, Toby, if I may, but... First, I'm, I'm fascinated uh, with anybody that makes a decision to go special forces. Myself, it, it, I just wasn't that sort of person. I think I'm, ironically, I could see myself more as that now. Well, not with my mindset now, but with my physical self now, because I'm quite fit. But back then, I felt I, I was, I found. I found the fizz side of it. The, the climbing and stuff I was really good at. The ropes, I was always the first or second guy at the ropes in training. Um, but the yomping and stuff with my little legs, I found it epic. And so based on the fact that the first part of Special Forces is the selection, and it's exactly that, yomping with heavy weights, I, um, I've got the utmost respect for anyone that went, yeah, I think I can do that. At what point did you start considering it? Um, do you know what? It was actually on that when I was on tour in Afghan. Um, believe it or not, I, I didn't even know the SVS existed um, when I came over and joined the Corps. I, I, I really thought that the Marines and the Royal Marine Commandos was special forces, you know, elite, elite forces. I thought, oh, 
um, I thought that was, you know, the special forces. And um, it was only once I'd gotten to a unit um, and, and speaking to people that I started hearing about special forces and these other, these other units. And that's when, it, well, straight away it piqued my interest. Straight away it piqued my interest and I was like, ooh, what's this all about? Um, and then everyone started saying, you know, oh, yeah, it's just taking it to the next level, the next level. It's this, and that's just the way my mind works. Is, you mean there's another challenge? You know, oh, I can test my mental in another way. Um, and... Yeah, when I got back from, from Eric 7, Eric 7, straight away I started inquiring. I started inquiring with uh, my company, Sergeant Major. Uh, yeah, I started inquiring about it. And he was like, yeah, you need so much experience first and you need to be in, in, the, in the core. You need to serve a bit of time and do a bit more uh, operational experience and stuff like this. And, um, but I was just so keen. Um, I was just so keen, uh, keen as mustard. And I was, uh, I just took the risk and uh, I just put in for it straight away when I got back off Eric 7, if I'm honest. Um, now, well, it took me about six months or so, no, maybe a bit longer, a year to put in for it, um, to actually I guess, yeah, uh, get get the confidence to put in for it, um, and I did, yeah. Um, but I, I knew straight away, I guess, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. Um, it just was, yeah, uh, wasn't really a question or a, anything, just something I knew I wanted to do. Mm. Did you do the diving phase when you were, were doing your training? Yeah, yeah, I went through um, selection and did all the um, parts of that. And, and uh, yeah, it was, it, was, um, it was really good stuff, really good stuff. And mm -hmm. made me um, just advanced, made me more of an advanced soldier and um, a lot more strings to my bow, a lot more skills, uh, yeah, it was, it was really good stuff. Mm -hmm. The reason I ask, I've had a, I've had a couple of SB guys on the podcast that because the need in Afghan was so great, they didn't do the dive dive phase, which for someone like myself, I'd have been like, yes. <laughs> um, I like diving. I've done a lot of diving around the world, but it's the um, it's the actual swimming swimming bit. Do you, do you have to be a really good swimmer? I mean. Not particularly, no, you don't have to be. I mean, yeah, you've got to hold your own. Um, yeah, you have to be, a, I'd say you have to have a good standard of swimming and you have not be afraid of open water and not be afraid of dark, claustrophobic spaces, I guess, um, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, personally, I, and then this is the opposite, I, I hate heights. I'm petrified of heights. Um, so, you know, the other side of, of special forces, um, the jumping in the air phase and, the, and all that, I was like, no, absolutely not. Do not like that. Obviously, we had to do that anyway. But, yeah, that, that side of it, I, that was what I was more afraid of, um, was the heights, diving in and water. I was like my comfort zone, you know. Um, I, uh, yeah, I've always, well, uh, growing up in South Africa and the ocean and, and the swimming and everything, it's, 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 it's quite common out there, you know. It's, mm -hmm. um, I guess it's the climate in South Africa and that. So, yeah, water, no, no problems at all. Heights, on the other hand, no. Did not like that phase at all. Didn't like it. Wasn't comfortable. And, um, yeah, did everything I could to steer away from it. Did you see any shark attacks when you are in South Africa surfing? No, no. I think that's a bit of, um, I mean, it's not, 
No, I never saw any shark attacks or anything like that. It does happen. It does happen, sure. I mean, in South Africa, yes, it's the, the ocean. It's their territory. But a lot of people think the sharks are just there all the time waiting for you. You know, as soon as you get in the ocean, yeah, there's going to be a shark. No, the odds are actually really, really small. You got the, I remember as a kid, we'd be swimming on the beach, uh, swimming in the ocean, and, yeah, the shark sirens would go off um, because they have coastal guards um, a bit further out and they'd spot a shark or something and the, the sirens would go off and people would all get out the water. But, yeah, it wasn't anything we we didn't, it didn't bother us. Mm-hmm. Not, if anything, it was quite funny because, you know, you make a joke out of it um, and it was as long as you could swim faster than your mates, you sorted. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was just one of those. Mm. Yeah, I'm a, I ask because um, there was a bit of, con, 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 there's been controversy, hasn't there, about the cage diving when they, Purposely chum the water to bring the yeah the, yeah, the, the, the yeah. sharks in yeah um, never did it um, I mean I, I I'm I'm a big animal lover and I'm I'm not such a fan of yeah people making like uh, money off the back of things like that and distressing the animals and things like that. I think uh, leave them in their own environment and just leave them alone and let them, yeah, if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't really agree with things like that, I'm honest. Without giving away any, you know, official secrets or anything, but what, what, what's hard or what was hard for you in SF training? Well, like I said, the, the, the jumps, the jumps phase, I uh, hated it. Um, you know, all the air stuff, hated it. If I'm do, honest. You have, do you have to do the halo and the yeah, the halo? Yeah, you gotta, yeah, you've got to do all that, um, uh, which is, is not nice. Um, you, have, you have to do all the, uh, the air, air stuff, so starting from your basic jumps course, you know, the stuff that, like, the paras do and um, mm. they call them, you, you know, your rounds, your rounds. With the, just the old, like, World War Two parachutes, you start off doing that stuff, you know, which you don't have any control over and you, you just stack it into the ground and you probably end up, you know, so many injuries. Um, in Bad. fact, a lot of blokes did a lot of injuries. I mean, mm. There were times when I was doing the air phase on those things. Those rounds were horrendous. Um, you hit the ground at such a such a speed and jolt. Um, I think at one point I used I, I was like I had such a migraine um, when I was going to bed um, from those impacts. Uh, it was horrendous, man. People twisting ankle ankles and knees and backs and everything oh oh man but yeah and then you go on to yeah just get more and more advanced um, as you as you go along yeah um but uh yeah it was really cool stuff just i don't like heights <laughs> to be honest. the secret is to land on a gurkha <laughs> why is that well they're soft oh bless man and and, and then they stand up and say I'm sorry, Saab. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, look, I know some great Gurkhas. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I know I do know some great Gurkhas and I've got full respect for those dudes. Um, so. Yeah, I did my course with, I think it was a fair share of Marines, Paras and Gurkhas and um, uh, very uh, endearing mountain yeah. men, aren't they? Yeah, they're lovely guys. Um Lovely guys, and I mean, Nims, Nims, see, yeah, everyone knows Nims, Nims, mm. Puja now, he's, uh, he's a very good friend of mine, and yeah, massive shout out to him for everything he's doing at the moment, mm. uh, huge props, um, but uh, yeah, we, we um, I actually bumped into him on Herrick 7, he was one of the Gurkhas out with, um, he was, he was one of the engineers out there. Kirk engineers helping us trying to 
build the forts. You know, I was talk, talking about digging those pits and um, trying to make uh, as best top cover as you could. Yeah, you, so that's where our first man knows. And then we were on our uh, sort of pre-selection phase together as well. Um, so we, we were on that together and then we went on, uh, yeah, and served, served in the, uh, the unit base down here in Poole. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a good, really good mate to them. And, uh, yeah. And uh, N- uh, N- Nims has been on the podcast. Oh, great. Yeah, good, man, because mm. uh, he's a oh. top lad, top lad. I'll ask Luke to put a link for it below. For anyone who's wondering who Nims is, Nims Die was a Gurkha, I think, the first Gurkha to join the special boat yeah, service. That's correct, yeah, yeah. And he's also the first person to summit all 14 of the world's highest peaks. And he did it in just over six months, which is, I think the previous record was something like seven years. And... Um, He's quite some unit, isn't he? You he know? is. Yeah, he's phenomenal. Him and his his team of, and he did it all with a team of of Nepalese, so um, so all all Sherpas, and they would just smash out Everest, go down a pub, drink and dance all night. Then the next day, go and smash Lotsy face or something. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was. Yeah, that's that's why me and him get along because that's just so. You know, my character was get shit faced the night before, and then go and have to do um, whatever it was the next day. You know, fizz in the morning at six six a.m. and I probably just got off the piss at probably five a.m. and you know, that's straight into it. Yeah. So. And also, he was very selfless, wasn't he? Because he saved people's lives. He was, yeah. While he was doing his record attempt, he took time off to bring people down the mountain and. Mm. So, some of them would have just been left for dead. If it yeah, wasn't. and that's credit to his character and and that Nepalese culture and character and the Gurkhas. They are just lovely people, and like I said, I have the utmost respect for those people. Mm. But the, yeah, just yeah, everything about them. What's the camaraderie like in in? Is it different to being in the Marines? I'm. No, um, no, I wouldn't say so. Um, yeah, the camaraderie is just good. It's just uh, would just it strong. would it surprise our friends at home listening to know how kind of normal some of these guys are? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're just normal, good, we're normal guys, and and um, I've just written my autobiography. And, and one of the things I wanted to get across in my autobiography was the reality of what the man is behind the special forces bravado. You know, who are these people in real life? And what are they like in real life? And where have they come from? And the truth is we're just normal men and we're just, you know, we have the same problems as anyone else and... Uh, that's that's really yeah one of the one of the core threads that goes through my autobiography is mm. yeah the man behind, the man behind uh, behind the soldier if you like yeah um, yes we're going to come on and talk about your wonderful memoir ne- never will I die that's right because um, yeah. that's another thing we've got in common along with being incredibly handsome. <laughs> We've both written books. <laughs> and it's yeah. A, well, it's another favourite subject of mine. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I've, I've written a book, a book, but um, yeah, I'll, t- I'll take that incredibly handsome. Hey, now I, t- my injury. <laughs> I, t- I, t- I tell anybody out there writing a book in so many ways, way harder than becoming a Royal Marine Commando. Um, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, I'll second that, mate. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's uh, and and it's also slightly difficult to get properly published, like you've been, and um, it's hard. Yeah, it's pretty hard. Yeah, to to work with an editor and to do cover design and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's a yeah, it's some experience. 
Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot harder than people think. And it's not just sitting down and writing and, um, you know, give it to a publisher and there you go. No, there's a lot more to it. Um, and obviously with what I was writing about, a lot of the stuff had to go through, um, but actually it still is going through disclosure. I found I had a lot of the backlash of talking about much like what I'm doing with yourself, Chris. I found myself going back to some dark times and um, not being able to sleep after writing a lot of it. Um, a lot of the PTSD stuff coming back, a lot of the anxiety and stress and the, uh, the upset and yeah, it was a, it was a roller coaster of a ride, mm. um, real roller coaster. Yeah, and people questioning you as to why you're doing it. Um, yeah, a lot of people have asked me, "Oh, are you just trying to make a career for yourself, and are you trying to, you know, ride off the coattails of the unit and things like that?" And uh, I have to say, and this is something um like you know fiercely protective about this book is about trying to empower people it's nothing to do about you know biceps and bullets it's nothing to do about that it's about showing the testament or a shout out to the testaments of the human spirit and it's a book of empowerment and i wanted it and i wrote this book to help people to inspire people, to encourage people, um, not to try and make a career out of, you know, being an SF soldier. And, and that's, yeah, that's something I'm, I really just want to say. Yeah. Well, you're, 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 you've already been empowering, empowering people up into this point, Toby, and you're doing it now by sharing your experience on this podcast i'm hoping after it when anyone thinks they're having a bad day they'll go oh hang on i'm not really am i <laughs> it's um you know some uh, uh, amazing what what you've come through can yeah. we talk about yeah. that then did how many times did you get injured altogether um quite a few times actually um i've been shot through the arm um which was a very lucky escape. Um, yeah, on a on an operation and a sniper got me in their crosshairs and um, luckily um, it just winged me basically. Um, million dollar wound, I suppose. Uh, one inch to the left and probably would have taken my arm completely off completely right off. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, the dragon off, uh, uh, yeah, dragon off sniper rifle. It's basically like the AK variant, uh, Russian variant of their sniper rifle out there and uh, high velocity round 7.62. Um, and if that had, yeah, one inch to the left would have hit, hit the bone of my, you know, my upper shoulder and probably would have taken my arm completely off um, or at, at very least shattered the bone and I would have had to have it amputated. Um, so, yeah, very lucky there. Um, as it was, went straight through, clean, clean straight through. Um, and I was back out on the ground uh, soon afterwards. Um, wow. And then the second time I was injured, unfortunately, wasn't as lucky. Um, again, on another operation on the ground. Uh, this time, close quarter combat went through a went through a door, and the enemy were set up ready for us, and. I caught up a burst of fire again, AK-47, uh, close, close quarter combat, and it's it was a burst of rounds in our direction, uh, and the first round went straight through my neck, 
and second round ricochet off the off my helmet. Um, you know, as a burst of fire, it, it sort of the rounds go up, up in a straight line as the barrel of the rifle goes up with a kick. And um, yeah, one went through my neck and the other one ricocheted off my helmet, which saved my life. Otherwise, again, um, well, that one would have gone straight through the side of my head and killed me instantly. Um, but the first round uh, hit my spinal cord um, and that obviously took me out straight away and paralyzed me instantly from the neck down. Um, and that was instantaneous. Um, the lads managed to drag me out of the compound, working on me there in the pitch black uh, at night, um, you know, trying to find, find the wound, find the entry wound, find the exit wound, stop the bleeding, check for a radial pulse. Okay, he's got a radial pulse. He's still alive. Call in the nine liner. You know, call in the call in the helos and let's yeah. Um, hopefully, he gets back to um, somewhere where we can w- work on him properly. Um, but it was very touch and go, very touch and go. Um, but here I am today. You know, did were you unconscious in, instantly, or is there any of it that you remember? Um, yeah, I was unconscious straight away. Um, you know, the lads, the lads are. From when I speak to them, I mean, they've seen enough death to know when it's serious because when there's no screaming and shouting, that's when you know he's probably uh, dead mm-hmm. because, yeah, there's, you know, if it, they're, they're calling my name and asking if I'm okay and I'm not responding. Um, and the way I fell, they, yeah, the lads are more, they're, they're seen enough of it and they're professional enough to know, okay, he's, he's seriously injured, if not dead. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I was unconscious. Um, so I don't remember much of that night. Um, I can kind of remember up to, up to a point, up to a point, and then just goes, yeah, black, out. Um, and the next thing I know, it's three months later, and I've been in a coma for three months, and um, I wake up in Birmingham ITU. Insane, really. Uh, I, I can't really explain it, if I'm honest, because there's the part of me that was like, what is going on? The, you know, where am I? Have I been captured? Um, am I being interrogated? My training was kicking in, um, so a lot of me was very scared, very weary. Um, I had a lot of drugs coursing through my veins, so I was very confused. Um, part of me was still saying, thank God I'm still alive. You know, Whew, okay, that's, that's a starting point. We can work with that. I'm alive. Um, uh, yeah, and then it was, why can't I move? Why am I sort of, I thought I'd been strapped down. You know, I thought they had had me strapped down. So, again, I thought I'd been captured, a lot of me. So I was, my mind was going in overdrive, like overdrive. Um, I thought I'd been pumped full of drugs to try and deliberately confuse me so that I would be, you know, able to, you know, like truth serum and mm-hmm. more talkative. Um, so I was, I was just going through my training and what I've been taught in, to, in this scenario. And that was, don't say anything, just, um, shut your mouth. Um, and yeah, and wait and see what happens. But yeah, I had so much going on. Um, very scary, very, very scary. Um, all these people, uh, you don't know who to trust. I was I was in solitary confinement because uh, of infection control. So I was just in like a glass room, one bed, uh, people looking at me through a window. 
Yeah. And all I could do was stare at the roof. I couldn't talk because um, I had this massive neck brace on and it was tracheostomy um, and I hadn't learned to talk again. I hadn't learned how to talk yet. Yeah, all these tubes and, you know, all my arms, all these IV lines and I had a spinal fluid drain coming out of my neck. Uh, Yeah, all these bottles of chemicals being pumped into my system. Yeah, very, very, very scary. Very scary. Who was the first person that approached you? Um, So I had the the surgeons there, but I weren't too sure who who they were. And I didn't recognize them, so I wasn't talking to them. I just, my training was kicking in. I was just keeping quiet. It was only until my RSM came in to the room and he was the first face I recognized. And he said, he basically had to debrief me and say, Toby, stand down. Um, yeah, stand down. You, you haven't been captured. You're, you're not in that scenario. This is what's happened. And he, he was the one who explained it to me and um, explained what had happened and that I was, yeah, very seriously injured. Uh, and then he, he was then, he called in the surgeon and they both had to explain to me the implications of my injury and that was basically I'm paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of my life um, and will breathe on a machine for the rest of my life Um, and yeah that just hit me like a ton of bricks um I couldn't believe it was real. I couldn't believe any of it. I couldn't believe what was going on. Um, so upset. Um, trying to process it all. I'd, I'd, I'd lost everything in the blink of an eye. My entire career, um, my body, my identity as a man, a very, very physical, capable man, young, good-looking Ruggedly handsome. (laughs) Everything was, you know, um, taken away in one split split second. Uh, Yeah. And how long does it take to process this? Uh, You don't. It's it's not. It's um, it's more of an ongoing process. It's Mm -hmm. I'm still learning. I'm still processing it now. You know, I'm still learning and how to deal with it. Um, and it's almost sometimes, sometimes it's a hundred steps back and one step forward. Um, uh, and it's, it's something you never really come to terms with. You just learn to deal with it, mm. with life. Um, but you, never, you, you never really come to terms with it. Um, you're always thinking, uh, you know, I wonder what it would be like if I wasn't, if I'd never got injured. Yeah. Did you? Was there? Was there a part of you that thought, "Hang on, no, I'm, I'm going to get this out of the way. I'm going to get back to my unit, get back to Afghan." Uh yeah, there were parts of me um, in the initial phases where I thought, I can beat this. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, there's going to be some sort of surgical procedure and I'm going to get fixed and I'll get back to, you know, being myself and, you know, what I know. Um, but the more time goes on, you know, there's, yeah, the more starts to sink in that that's not going to happen. Were your family by your side at this time? Um, 
my family did come over to um, to the UK when when I was first injured, and they were with me. But I'm not, I don't have a close family. Um, you know, the only person I'm I'm very close to is probably is my brother, my elder brother, um, and and he stayed with me for. Most of the time, you know, um, my parents were there for the initial sort of phase of the waking up, but they they went back to South Africa fairly fairly quickly afterwards. Um, but my brother stayed with me throughout the um, that initial phase where I was very because I was still very very ill. I was very sick, you know. I had a lot of um, surgery. I mean, they. They, the initial prognosis was that I was completely brain dead because they couldn't do an MRI scan because of the metal, the metal in, you know, shrapnel in my neck. So there was no chance of an MRI scan. So the prognosis was that due to the, probably the oxygen starvation and the length of time it took to get him back to, from, from the, you know, from the, uh, in the middle of Afghan, he, he's more than likely going to be brain dead. Um, so, there was this period where they weren't actually too sure whether or not to bring me out of a coma. They thought it might actually be best if they turned the machine off, you know. Um, and that came to a decision that they, that they gave to my brother. My brother was the man who had to decide whether or not we try and bring him out of a coma and see if he is actually still in there or we do the humane thing and we switch the machine off um, and uh, my brother said no no let's give him the chance let's give him that chance I believe in him he's the strongest man I know and yeah so they brought me out and luckily I was actually still, you know, compass mentors. You know, I still had, yeah, sort of, um, I don't know what you call it. Um, I, yeah, still was thinking. Um, but yeah, it was uh, tough times. And uh, like I said, I was still very ill. Um, a lot of, so I still had to have a lot of surgery. I had 50, 52 staples keeping the back of my neck connected basically to my, you know, my head on my shoulders basically. Um, I couldn't talk. I couldn't eat. Um, I had to learn all these things again. Um, I caught pneumonia um, whilst in hospital. Um, so I had double pneumonia in both lungs. Um, and again, they thought that probably I was not going to make it um, because of the stress on my body and what I just, the stress that I just come through, the pneumonia was taking hold and um, they were getting IV antibiotics into the, into the body, but they weren't working. Um, so it was very touch and go for a long period. Uh, and then I managed to, you know, get better um, after, uh, yeah, terrible, you know, when you're very ill like that, you become delusional. Um, I was coughing up a lot of blood. Um, all this blood was coming out, suctioning. I had to suction all this blood out of my lungs. Um, and then I got better for a while, but then unfortunately I caught pneumonia again um, for a second time. Um, and this time my body was so swollen, they couldn't actually get any of the needles into my veins to get the IV antibiotics in into, into me. And again, uh, they, they were like, if he, if he makes it through the night, it's, it's a miracle. Um, 
And eventually they got an IV drip into my foot. They found a vein on the top of my foot. And they managed to get that in. Um, but they said if he makes it through the night, if he makes it through the night, he'll be okay. But if he doesn't, yeah, it's, yeah, that's it. And my brother stayed with me, um, yeah, throughout the night. And he, he was, uh, I mean, I, I remember, you know, looking, vaguely seeing him and seeing other people, you know, very delusional and couldn't piece it all together. But my brother told me afterwards, he said, that was the scariest moment he's ever experienced. Uh, you know, he, I was, he said I was white as a sheet. Um, basically, it was like looking at a dead person. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but I made it through it um, and got better. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was, yeah, just the beginning of my journey, really, um, into what is now my new life, I guess. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, I mean, you obviously went into some sort of supported living. Yeah. Um, after spending a year, over a year in total in hospital on my back, um, staring at the roof, um, and people say, you know, well, marine training is hard and SF selection is hard and this is hard and that is hard. That was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do um, is to stare at a ceiling for a year. Um, yeah, it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do just to stay sane. And I truly mean that, to stay sane without losing my mind. Um, because I can't move and I had a neck brace and all I could do was stare at the roof 12 hours, well, 24 hours a day um, and then try and sleep. Um, but, yeah, uh, I moved out of that and I uh, moved into assisted living down in pool um, and that's where my unit started helping me and started trying to build some resemblance of a life. Yeah, um, started trying to then get funding and, you know, go through the rigmarole of of being discharged and moving on to the NHS and, um, you know, yeah, just uh, going through the, the bureaucracy of, of, of um, being an injured, injured veteran, trying to um, integrate back into society, I suppose. Which organisation helped you the most? Uh, there was a few organisations. Uh, Help for Heroes being one. Massive shout out to Help for Heroes. Can't thank them enough. Uh, if anyone, again, is listening, that charity, what it does is phenomenal. You know, um, a lot of people think because we're not at war at the moment, or we don't have troops that are in a, you know, conflict at the moment, that there's no need for these charities. But there are a lot of injured veterans out there who need lifelong care, and that takes a lot of money and a lot of support, which is expensive. You know, veterans are for life, not just for Christmas. You know, it's forever. And there's a lot of injured veterans out there who, yeah, need a lot of support. Um, so massive shout-out to Help for Heroes. If anyone's listening, keep supporting them. When did you have your first beer? <laughs> Do you want to hear a good story? Um, so I was still in hospital um, in, in recovery and I'd, I'd been moved to Salisbury Hospital now where the spinal unit is. And um, I had one of my mates come up to hospital and um, we were talking and he was like, right, uh, do you think it's possible if we can get you out just for a couple of hours? We will you, we'll wheel you down downtown and, and uh, yeah, we can um, have a beer. And all the surgeons and all the nurses and everyone was like, you know, obviously absolutely not, no chance. 
Um, but uh, we managed to convince them, like semi break me out of hospital. Um, I don't think they actually knew I was going for a beer to the pub. I think they just wanted, they thought I was just going for some fresh air because I've been, you know, stuck in this hospital for so long. Anyway, um, we managed to get me uh, get me out and wheeled me out of the hospital really quickly, quickly, uh, got me onto the bus, you know, just a normal bus outside the hospital. And uh, before they could really say no officially, we, we were already downtown and we were, yeah, straight in the pub and I... Um, yeah, I had my first beer. Um, and it was like, you know, golden nectar, <laughs> if I'm honest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But again, this was after I I learned how to swallow again because, um, you know, throughout my uh, rehabilitation process, I had to learn how to talk, how to eat, how to swallow um, and all this. So, yeah, it was a bit bit of time after that but that first beer was like nectar golden nectar from the gods wondering how you're dealing with the the trauma because that presents in very obscure ways i mean depression you can be depressed and not know you're depressed right um and i'm yeah. one i'm wondering how you manage that route a lot of veterans obviously turn to to alcohol and you're yeah. all, you're already juggling a cocktail of of drugs, which which makes it then hard to. We had this discussion earlier, didn't we? It, you know, makes it hard to balance your mood and yeah, it, yeah. It, it, all, it all can become dangerous territory. Is, was that ever an issue? Yes, a big issue. Um, I mean, first of all, getting off the cocktail of drugs that they'd had me on for so long in the hospital. Um, like I was on some serious sedatives, um, IV sedatives. Um, and then when they were weaning me off that um, and, and the sleeping medication and things, I, I found that very hard. Uh, waking up in the middle of the night, you know, screaming cold sweats, um, not knowing what was going on, very confused. Um, but yeah, that that was that was quite tough. But um, once once I'd gotten out of hospital and um, I was now sort of in a in a I guess semi adapted house for me while I was transitioning back into Surrey Surrey Street. Um, yeah, I started struggling, really started struggling psychologically. Um, and I, I basically was finding, I mean, it's, it's easy to look back now and say, yeah, I was, I was struggling with depression, massively struggling with depression. Um, I started finding myself asking the questions of why am I even here? What is the point of this? And you know, it would be f far better if I wasn't here. And I started, yeah, I started drinking um, and I started getting in touch with some, some bad people um, who were basically, you know, um, I started doing drugs, started getting back onto the stronger medication that was not meant for that purpose, mm. if you know what I mean. Mm. It was, so I had medication that was for pain relief and um, other things, and I started telling my nurse, you know, that I was in extreme pain so that she'd be giving me more and more drugs um, and more and more sort of, drugs to relax me and calm me down. But it was more just because, well, I was just lying basically to, so I could get on, more on the drugs to just disappear in my mind, you know, become dull, flat, not there. Um, 
and I would, I'd be staring out the window for eight hours a day, not moving. I'd just stare out the window. Um, it become basically just, I don't know, inert. Uh, and it was a really, really horrible time. Horrible, horrible time. Because uh, I was sort of still on the, on the, on the marriage patch. Down on the unit, I'd still be hearing the lads running, doing fizz, you know, the troops would come running past. Uh, I could hear, I could hear the helos coming in. The lads were still going out on jobs and doing stuff, you know. Um, the unit was still carrying on and I just felt like I was just being left out and, oh, yeah, I, uh, I really, really struggled, really struggled. And I eventually got to a point where, yeah, I wanted to end my life. Um, and I started looking into ways of actually how that could be done um, or if it could be done. And it, it turns out it can be done, it can be done um, through various, you know, sort of loopholes in the medical system of, you know, refusing medical treatment and stuff like that. So, yeah, I started um, preparing. I actually literally started preparing. Um, and it's a funny one because I didn't want to. It was a massive part of me that still wanted to carry on living. But there was a, the, the bigger part of me at the time was saying, no, nah, I'm done. I'm done. It's... Um, it's time to call it quits. I've definitely been down the drug route. I don't think that's any secret to anyone. Yeah. And and the alcohol and, and, yeah, yeah. and prescription medication. I I, yeah. I I get it all, mate. I obviously I haven't been in your situation, but I, I do. I'm I, I'm very fortunate in this life. I've someone said to me something when I was in Hong Kong and I was looking for a bit of attention one day. So I said to my mate, oh, I'm thinking of killing myself, right? It, nothing was going, uh, you know, people can read my memoir if they want to find out more, but nothing was going right. And I, I, I too, all my career in the means had gone. I, I thought I'd lost my house. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so I said to my mate, one day, yeah, I'm thinking to kill him. And he just turns to me and Chris, you ain't going to kill yourself. He said, because and I'm not saying this is true here, folks. I'm just telling you what he said. And what he said is, to kill yourself, you have to hate yourself and you don't hate yourself, Chris. I remember thinking, oh yeah, I don't, do I? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm laughing, but to, it was a silly, it's a silly little anecdote. But basically I, after that, I, I, I've always just remembered that conversation. Um, and um, I've, I've been fortunate. I have a very fierce survival streak in me because of my rough childhood and because when you when you yeah, chronic yeah. when you're in chronic addiction you've got no one Every, everyone leaves your life and to be honest I, I can't say i blame them yeah the, but, it, but it's the stigma the stigma that you then have to go through people saying this behind your back and the, and, and 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 that's made me fiercely like fuck everybody you know Fuck you. I'm as equal on this planet to every other person on it. And with that, I just, I still do it now. If ever going for a wobble, just fucking hold my head up high, you know? Um, I, I, yeah. I, it's so, I relate to that. There's something so common there, that survival streak and that exactly what you're talking about there, about holding your head high and, um, Believing in yourself, the, the, believing in yourself. And um, that's, I think, what made me, I don't know, something deep inside me was because I didn't hate myself. I just thought I was just in this mind frame of I'm so depressed and I've lost everything. It's just more humane to, yeah, almost, uh, I don't, I don't like to say kill myself. It was more like just put myself down, you know, like, like you, you know, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So much pain and suffering and everything. 
there's part of me that was just like, it's it's more humane if if to just let 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 you let yourself go. But then there's the other side of me that's like, fucking hell, Toby. I don't know. There, there's this anger in me, and this yeah, that survival streak that says, mm-hmm. no, I will not go quietly. I will not go quietly. Um, and that's that's a poem, by the way. That's a poem by Dylan Thomas. Do not go quietly into that gentle night. Resist, resist against the dying of the light. And um, I'm always just, yeah, that, that inside me is just like pounds and pounds and pounds away. And that was the part of me that said, no, Toby, go and get some help. This cannot be the end of it. It can't be the end of your story. It can't be the end of your journey. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. See, I'll say this for our friends at home. That a big part of the battle is you're in this spiral. And a big thing that supports that spiral is you're still playing by society's bullshit fucking rules and people's bullshit attitudes and that in this life we need to aspire to be this or we need to aspire and we have to have, we have to be physically able, we have to be macho. Yeah. And my point was I had an epiphany where I couldn't go any lower. I was just kept having nervous breakdowns and literally crying my fucking eyes out. So alone, you know, and, and, and on yeah. one of them, it, it just hit me. Oh my God, what have I done? I've, it, forget everybody else and whatever people may have done to you in your life, but I, I've done this to myself. And it was at that moment I realized to come out of it, I had to rebuild my life, my thinking, what I aspire to, not, not you know, and the one thread, I guess, that's so strong in all of that is you have to be grateful for this life, you know? And probably like yourself, I thought about my mates that weren't here anymore and they'd all died young and they'd all died in horrible ways, you know, either in the Marines or, you know, uh, through, through drugs, whatever it might be. And I thought, you know, I'm not them. They're gone. What yeah. would they, what would they give to be in my position now? And, and, that was my, that was like my epiphany and my rebuilding point. And every day from then on, I've, I felt different. I still sitting here now. I, I'm, I'm in a different headspace to that. I'm, I'm so um, grateful that I've been given this chance in this amazing universe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, and I created a set of rules that's so strong that it doesn't matter what I go through. I fucking wake up in paradise and I go to bed in paradise. Um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, I do. I remember the turning point for me and, and yeah, because I've been exactly that through that point and um, how many, yeah, how many people in life get given a second chance, you know? How many people, and, and I was given a second chance, make no bones about it, I was given a second chance. It was like I was in my, on my deathbed and some, it was like, yeah, you know, all right, we'll give you another chance. And, and it took me a while to realise that, and, like, you know, it doesn't come overnight. It doesn't. I, I ended up... Um, in a psychiatric hospital, um, the Priory Hospital. I don't know if you know. It's like a, yeah. It's like um, a famous rehab, is is it not? Yeah, it's like a rehab for people. And, um, yeah, I ended up going to the Priory, which was um, where I spoke to someone and he said to me, Toby, Toby, I just want you to do one thing. Because I, I didn't want to talk to psychiatrists and, and you know, people who uh, they had to help me. I, I wasn't interested. I'd made up my mind. Um, and he was like, Toby, I just want you to think about one thing. Do me one favour. Um, and he left me a pen and paper and he said, just write down 
three things, three, three things that you think define you as a person. And I, I remember writing it down and it was things like resilience and passionate and um, loyal and all these great things. And that, that was the point, yeah, where I started actually thinking about what I have to offer and who I am as a person and that I don't, just because I'm paralyzed and I look a certain way and there's a stigma around disabled people. Um, yeah, I've still got a lot to give. And, yeah, I was, I was given a second chance and I, I do every day wake up and I, I, I tell myself that all the time. And exactly what you just said about, yeah, you know, all the people that weren't given second chances. It'd be like just unjust for me to just throw it away a second chance because they'd probably, well, they'd do anything for a second chance, you know, and they're not even here to question it. And I am. So, yeah. Mm. yeah. And you owe, you owe your brother one as well. Uh, big time, big time. And, um, yeah, uh, um, I don't like to tell him. I don't like to say it to him because, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I do own um, big time, big time. Uh, yeah. That, that, yeah, that was it really there, wasn't it? Yeah. So when did you start thinking about your business? And my God, we could have a whole nother podcast yeah, yeah. on that alone. Perhaps we, perhaps, perhaps we just should, but do you want to give us a kind of summary, how you uh, come up with the idea? How did you think it was workable? Well, I mean, this is when I was actually still in the Priory and I started my rehab and um, I started turning my life around, you know. I got into that T-junction, you know, that crossroads in my life and it was, you know, make the decision. And if you're going to make the decision to stick around, don't waste it, you know, let's make a good go of it. Let's make the best go of it we can. Uh, so I started thinking about what I was, what I was interested, in, what I liked doing, what gave me joy and passion and made me feel happy in my life. Um, and growing up in South Africa, I was always into extreme sports. So I loved surfing and being in the ocean. Um, I loved the dirt bikes, the motocross, you know, just being out there on, you know, yeah, um, and all these sort of extreme sports. So, and even even in our, throughout my military career, you know, um, I, I carried on doing these things when I had free time. Um, so they've always been a big part of my life. And I wanted to try and, well, just keep in with that. And I figured, yeah, why not start an extreme sports brand? You know, something that's, got that you know really cool edgy extreme sports feel about it and it's about surfing and motorbikes and dirt bikes and, and all that but it's got a like a really cool message that I, I want to try and promote as well and that's you know bravery and being brave in life and being brave enough to stand up to whatever it is that faces you and the challenges throughout life so, yeah, so I tried to bring these two together, these two worlds together. And I thought of a well, wicked extreme sports brand that ultimately is a lifestyle brand. And that lifestyle is about being brave. And, and the message behind the brand is go out there, live your life to the fullest. Don't be afraid and enjoy the ride. You know, enjoy mm. the ride. Um, do you take a part in, in? Do you take a part in designing all the gear? I mean, I'm guessing. You yeah, do. yeah, I do. Um, so then um, I started pulling the business together. But uh, I, to be honest, um, just to take one step back, when I started looking into this, I had no business background. Um, I had absolutely no knowledge on business, 
Um, but I was smart enough to know that if I was going to start a business, I think the best thing to do is go and get some knowledge and go and learn a bit and do a bit. So I, um, I decided to go back to college, go back to school. But um, because my grades were so rubbish, they were like, and I was, you know, I never did well at school anyway when I was back in South Africa. They were like, you're going to have to start. You'd have to start from scratch, basically. I was like, all right, here we go. Let's start this. So I started my GCSEs again. And then from there, I went on and to college and I did my A-levels. Um, and I, once I'd done my A-levels, I decided then I wanted to do a business degree. So I applied for university and wanted to do a, you know, a, a bachelor of, a Bachelor of Arts in Business. Um, and I, uh, I did a four-year business degree. And I approached that as I approach everything in my life, which is full on, don't hold back. If you're going to do something, do it properly. Um, and I came up with the first class honors degree. Um, and I achieved the Outstanding Student Award as well. Um, so I got a business, yeah, business degree. And um, that's just to show that people, you know, <laughs> I'm paralyzed. I'm in a wheelchair. I can't move. And I've still managed to go right back to school, start my GCSEs again, pass that, pass my A-levels, get a degree, and start a business. So, yeah, so I went anyway, yeah, I did all that and I got my business degree. So now I've got a background in business and I know I know what I was doing. And then I started bolting the business together. And then I started thinking about design, um, supply chains, you know, manufacturers, uh, logistics, um, you know, all the things, yeah, finance, so on and so forth, um, and just building it all together. Um, and I got involved in the design side because I like that. It's cool. Um, it's quite it's quite a fun part of the business. Um, so yeah, I, I do help out a lot with that. Um, but predominantly, my my background is sort of the operational side of, of the business, and it's where I find my strengths are, and that is almost pulling everything together, getting a product from the design phase all the way through to the customer, making sure all the parts of the business are running running as they should. Does that, does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah, um, yeah. It's a it's a big it's a big old thing, you know? Yeah, it's a massive machine, you know, running a business or starting a business is not just, you know, as simple as buy something for this price and sell it for more and you make money. Mm. You know, there's a lot more to business than just that. Um, Who does all, all your packing and mailing out? Um, so at the moment, I've got uh, a couple of people who work here. We do all the packaging, work with me. Um, you know, Bravery is only small time. It's a small time gig. You know, um, I've only got a couple of people who work for me and they help do all the packaging and all the designing on the computers and uh, delivering. Uh, and it's all eco-friendly as well. So all the packaging is all 100% eco-friendly because I'm still, you know, like with the animals and, and things, I'm a massive fan of the environment and I'm a big, big, big supporter of um, companies trying to go more sustainable and more eco-friendly and environmentally friendly. I think it's the way to go. Uh, we only have one planet. And if we, you know, just, if we carry on the way we are going, yeah, I mean, we're going to trash it. Um, that really annoys me. We're, we are intelligent human beings. We should be smarter than this. We really should, you know. And it's because of the yeah the whole just the way the world the way the world is structured around, around business now it's almost like we're, we've caught ourselves in a trap and we can't get out of it. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? 
like we're so reliable on on these fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. We're so dependent on all these companies and stuff, and they're yeah, so hard to change it all. Yeah, we're, it's like we're living a false life, isn't it? We 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 can live in such comfort because we're burning part of the planet that we can yeah, never yeah. never replace. Yeah, and if we could just get to you know get away from all these damaging things. I know it's easier said than done because we're so reliant on it and it's, it's like a vicious cycle. You know, how do you, how do you get out of that cycle? Um, that, that's a real problem. Um, but we, like I said, we're intelligent human beings. We can do it. We just need to put the effort and the resources behind it. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do as well with bravery, you know, have a company that relies you know well it's environmentally friendly it's you know as sustainable as possible it's um so it's a wicked side of the brand it's a really cool side of the brand which i think is the way to go if i want to. um yeah and how 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 were the challenges writing a book um yeah how, going back to how do you book. even do it um so i i got a ghost writer comes in and we, we, we have like a, a dictaphone and he records and I, I talk to him um, and we record our conversations and then after that he types it all up. We have a, like a, subs not a subscriber. It's a, um, oh, I've forgotten the word. Uh, basically they get um, taken from audio into like written down I like transcribing. Yeah, transcribe. That's a, yeah, yeah. Um, transcribed. And then we, we go through it and we, we rewrite it um, into sort of that kind of format of, of a book. Uh, so it's quite a few, yeah, it's quite a bit of challenges to it, but it's interesting. I mean, but it's, it's usually the hardest thing I find about it is, is just really going in depth into those, into the memories of childhood. Being having a rough childhood, um, having yeah, and you know, losing people in the Marines and friends, and, and then going through the SF side of things, and then losing everything, and then having to start again from scratch and, and basically build myself up from nothing, um, literally going back to GCSEs, and yeah. And here I am today. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, writing a book has been challenging, but I hope it's going to all be worth it and hope it's for the right reasons, if you know what I mean. It's exciting. When's it released? Uh, yeah. So the book, Never Will I Die, uh, by me, myself, Toby Guthridge, um, is now available to pre-order on Amazon and Waterstones. If you go there and, and just Google Never Will I Die, the book will come up. We'll put a um, we'll put a link a link for it below the podcast, so don't worry about that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Chris. Um, but it's out on the 9th of June. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, 9th of June it'll be out. Um, and hopefully it uh, does really well. I'm hoping. Um, well, you've done really well to even get a book out let's acknowledge that and anything else is a bonus right and yeah it is yeah it is um but if it can help one person and it just inspires one person to get out of that dark space or, or to show people that no matter how how bad it gets there is always light at the end of the tunnel you know mm. you just have to just keep going um like winston churchill said when you're going through hell just keep going. Just keep going. What choice do you have, mate? Yes, exactly. So, and so yeah, yeah. Just one, one last thing I, I better give a mention. Your friend, friends with Titch McCormack. Have, have I got that Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, such great friends. Served together um, down here in Poole. We served together. Um, he has just gotten a fantastic show out with the BBC, it's on BBC 2, 8 o'clock on Sunday nights called The Speed Shop. Check it out. It is awesome. And I did the first episode. 
so the first episode was about me and him and we built this wicked side for, for myself to get me back on the motorbikes, um, which is so cool. Um, and what a great project it was. But, um, yeah. Well, why don't you, you both come on the show and talk us through it? Oh, we'd love to. We'd love to. And I I've, got, I've got Titch's num- number on my phone. We were chatting back along and... As can often happen in the podcast world, you something else comes up, and then you you both live in busy lives, and and um, this is where I need a a, a PA. <laughs> well, yeah, I've, yeah, tell me about it. I've, actually, Luke does a wonderful job with this sort of thing, so I'll um now he's seen this. Hello, Luke. Could you um get this sorted, mate, please? Um, yeah, that would be a great show. Yeah, and I know Tish would love to do it because he's just um. Oh, he's such a cool dude. Um, me and him, where we get on like a house on fire, and uh, you know, he's, um, he'd love to promote his show. But he's also got some great stories about you know overcoming adversity and um, that mental mind state of um, keep striving, keep going. Uh, so yeah, that'd be great. That'd be a great. <laughs> that'd be a great one. And uh, he's a he's a very funny character as well. So. Um, I think that'll be a blast if I'm honest. Yes, I think so. Toby, listen, I, I could chat to you forever. Um, yeah, I know, and we have to wrap things up otherwise. Well, it, it, it's um, the problem with, I say this a lot, sorry to friends at home if you heard it before, but people haven't got as much time now to listen to podcasts as they did during the lockdown. That's true, yeah. yeah and so I always try to shy on going on for hours. We used to just talk and talk and talk, but if you think uh, about it, if yeah. you think about people looking at their phone and there's a podcast that's 20 minutes and there's one that's yeah. three, three hours and they're on their way to work, they're going to go for the 20-minute one. So uh-huh. we, we don't do ourselves favours doing the long um, yeah, yeah. the long haul podcast now, but the good thing about that means you can come back on the show and we can <laughs> talk about uh, yeah business another phase of your life and the- yeah I mean there's so many things we can talk about there's you know there's this business there's uh, the mental side of it there's the and I mean when I talk about mental side of it I'm talking about the, the horrible side of it and the good side of it and the positive side of it and yeah South Africa we can talk about the Marines. There's so many things we could talk about. Um, yeah. Yeah. It'd be good to do a book together on the subject. Mate, that would be, yeah. Getting people out of a dark place. Exactly. And I think we've got so much synergy there between me and you. Um, geez, we could do a lot of good for a lot of people, man. Yeah. But uh, if it's all right, Chris, I mean, I, I just forgot to say there uh, with bravery, if people want to follow us um, or follow me or because I don't have any personal um, social medias. I only use my bravery. So my Instagram account is at bravery underscore UK. Um, people want to check out the brand, see what it's all about, find out more about it and more about me. Um, and then, yeah, on Facebook, um, bravery organization if they search that on facebook mm-hmm. follow us please follow us it'll be great um yeah on your following insta- the more it gets out there on your insta you want to um if you can put out some personal stories about your time when you served it's massive massively popular and you can develop quite a quite a following it's a bit of a shame really i don't I, I never really thought about the Marines for about 15 years after I left. I, I didn't even, like, I'd maybe bump into one of the lads every five years and it was, yeah. like, oh, hello, mate, how's it going? Yet? And I certainly, I was, you know, I had no, like, oh, I need to be wearing the core pattern shirt. And I was, yeah. I just didn't, didn't think about it. Yeah, yeah. No. And then um, when I started doing the podcast, it's just one of those things. And it's, it's, it's a bit sad, really is you tell a story about overcoming adversity, getting out, smashing your goals, running 999 miles pretty much non-stop, doing four quadruple Ironmen, right? Yeah. This, this is all stuff I've done. You get like 
400 views on a podcast. It's, it's just tragic. And yet if you tell a story about, you know, how you polish your boots in training one, it's like thousands of views. <laughs> really? And, oh and, man, I don't know. Yeah. So, so going yeah. back to what you're saying earlier is, yeah, I'm, I don't hide the fact I, I've, ironically for someone who never thought about the mob for 15 years i've i've ridden yeah. off but you know i went through the I, tough- I, I did as well i didn't want to talk about this i didn't want to do the book there's this thing in in the sf world as well about how you have to keep under the radar and stay off the radar and don't don't highlight yourself and you know there's a stigma around what we what i'm doing now on podcasts don't get me wrong it's not as bad as it used to be but um there's still a stigma around i shouldn't be doing this yeah i shouldn't be talking about the stuff i should like you know i shouldn't be talking about mental health and um i shouldn't be talking about my time and writing books and doing podcasts and having a social media blah blah blah. but the truth is is, you know (sighs) well they they ain't going to come and pay your bills for you no, no, Se- not. Secondly, you went through... I'm in a shit fucking situation, man. I wake up every day and have to fucking question my sanity, you know. Um, yeah, uh, so it's kind of like... It's, know, yeah, it's, uh, also, it's also... We went through the toughest military training in the world and you, yeah. went, on, you went on to do tough... Uh, we did that. We have every right, you know, that's part of us, part of our life experience... Yeah, we have we have part of us. Yeah, and and the the final thing. Sorry, I just want to say is what other people think. That's their business, and to be in any kind of like the media game, that's that's the first. You got to get that fucker put to bed. (laughs) That's where I struggle because I'm so self conscious anyway, and my you know I don't have a lot of self confidence because of my injury and the way I look and. You know, I'm conscious of the way people look at me and I'm intimidated and these things. So, yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard for me um, to put myself out there mm-hmm. and to push my brand bravery. Is, it's so hard. But I do it because it's it's ultimately what is the brand about? That's what the brand is about. It's about facing your your, your challenges and then growing as a human being. Um so that's why I do it. And that's why I use all the help in the world is you're not only helping me, Chris, by, by, doing, by letting me be on your podcast. You're not only helping me psychologically, you're helping everyone else by putting my story out there and, and, yeah, and your story, you know. Thank you, mate. And um, you just got to keep being, being yourself, Toby, because you're a fucking lovely bloke. I appreciate that, mate. And I just, yeah, I'm, um, I just want to be happy, you know. I just want to enjoy life, and and then, yeah. Thank God I'm here well, every day. If I'm up pool, are you still in pool? Yeah, yeah. I'm based yeah. Just that's that pool. Yeah. I'm, o- I'm overdue a, due a trip there. I'm going to come up and have a go on Ben's oh. mo- motorbike. I think so. Mate, if you're up here and you do, yeah, uh, please. I'd, I'd honestly, I'd love to go for a beer and a chat um, where we can actually sit down and talk forever because. It helps me. It does help me talking this out. It's helping me, you know, on so many levels. You have no idea. Yeah. yeah. I, my, my simplest rule, if I could say to anybody, other than what's your pH diet, folks, but other than that, is smile at the morning sun. It's what I do every day and say yeah. thank, thank you, Mother Nature, for this life. And everything else work, works itself out from there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, all right, Chris. Brilliant, mate. Thanks ever so much, Toby. Um, to everybody at home, I hope you've got as much out of this wonderful chat as I have. Um, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. Please smile at the morning sun. And just remember, there's always someone out there that's going through something worse than you. And things always get better. See you.